He's an army ranger, he's a Shark Tank business person, and he's a producer of a film at Sundance. Matt Griffin, welcome. No, thanks for having me. You know, I hear about the SEALs all the time, and you know, they are the best of the best, but you know, what's an army ranger? I, I describe SEALs as a, a surgical role of tools, like they have a very specific job. And then people are like, well, how do you describe rangers? And well, we're a dump truck full of sledgehammers. <laughs> that's, that's what rangers are. Um, we have more kills and captures of high value targets than every other unit combined. Uh, we don't write a lot of books. Uh, we don't, don't make a lot of movies about us because we're just busy working. I was at 2nd Ranger Battalion, which is in special operations. What do you do, or what did you do? Uh, I was a fire support officer, so I was actually an artillery guy. So I coordinated all of the close air support, helicopter, gunfire, mortars, and all of the other big things that went boom for the ground force operations. And in Afghanistan and Iraq? Uh, three to Afghanistan and one to Iraq. Wow. i got to ask you this. You're also a West Point grad, so is the military your life? Uh, my great-grandfather, World War I veteran. Uh, grandfathers both fought in World War II. Uh, my father was 20-year retired Army, and so it was a logical path for me to go, uh, was to go to the military. And so it was either get a job, get a scholarship, or join the military. So I combined the two and got a scholarship and joined the military and went to West Point. You know, in, a, in one way I'm reluctant to ask this, but uh, in another way I think it's probably part of you now. Uh, are there things that happened there that you regret? Are you talking about the military or West yeah. Point? Yeah. Uh, there are a few things that I regret. Um, you know, I, uh, so you're just doing your job, right? And you can always second guess things, but everything worked out the way it was supposed to. There was no change in it. So in the, in the long run, looking back, are you glad you went? I'm very glad that I served my country. It, it changed my life. Uh, it showed me how to plan, how to operate, how to move people to get large, challenging missions done. And I've tried to use those skills to translate to doing something better with the rest of my life. You know, and in fact, we're sitting here in the offices of combat flip-flops, and that's something that you have formed with the mantra, business not bullets. What's that all about? Uh, we believe that now it's better to go and do things with business. Um, there used to be a good foreign policy when you studied sociology in college of the McDonald's theory of international politics. Two countries that have McDonald's have never gone to war. Oh. Right? It's, and so, you know, we've been preaching it for years, and why aren't we doing it more now with other businesses? We're the strongest economy on the planet. We have entrepreneurial geniuses in mind. We have great educational facilities that can train people for business. Let's do better relations, foreign relations that way, instead of at the end of a barrel, at the end of a gun. Why did you come to this conclusion? Uh, after I got out of the military, I started going back to um, the Middle East and Asia for a company called Remote Medical International. And we were putting in clinics and you know, providing doctors and services to government contractors working overseas. And when I went there, I showed up as Griff. I didn't have body armor and a gun and a hundred barrel chested friends with equally armed. I had a briefcase, some cash and a smile, and I had to be nice. And what I found was that the areas that were flourishing with small businesses were the most secure. Those business owners took care of their street corners and they promoted the local security. And so I would always stay at the local restaurants. I would always stay at the, the, above the grocery store. I would hire the local guys as my drivers and they always kept me safe. And I, I just kept seeing that everywhere I went was that small businesses were the ones that were promoting security. And it just kept hitting me over and over and over again that this is what we should be doing as a nation. You have formed a company called Combat Flip Flops, you and some others of your friends. Mm -hmm. And did you serve with your, with your friends as uh, well? Uh, so there's three business partners. Uh, one's Donald Lee, so we served together in the Rangers. Uh, so he was my first business partner and the next one's my brother. Uh, so there's the, the merry three of us started our company and now we're a team of five, so we got two more people that we work with. Those friendships that you developed uh, as an Army Ranger, though, are really pretty special to you, aren't you? Yeah, they're the longest friends I've ever had in my entire life. You know, we could not see each other for years, and next thing you know, they're going to show up on your front porch in the middle of the night, and it's like you never, never missed each other. And it's real important to the last part of what we're going to talk about, but we're not there yet, though. we got to talk about combat flip-flops. But first, your bracelet. Yeah, so we, uh, we make jewelry out of landmines. So this was a former landmine that was dropped during the Vietnam War. And so it was detonated through the Mines Advisory Group. Local artists turn it into jewelry. And then for each piece sold, th clears three square meters of landmines. So we're literally taking back terrain, taking back earth. And it's oh my gosh. Yeah, we've cleared over 17,000, almost 18,000 square meters of landmines. Just from those bracelets? Just from the bracelets. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, how do you sell them? Uh, everything is online at combatflipflops.com. Okay, yeah. we're going to be putting that up uh, often uh, because there's so many different products that are amazing in their the social impact that they have. Let's just put it that way. 
Show us some shoes. So this is uh, this is our AK-47. Uh, so everything that we have you know, has a kind of a military name, mm -hmm. um, but the AK is, a, is the weapon of the revolutionary. It's like all over the world, if you're a revolutionary and you want to do something, you, you carry an AK because it always works. And so we designed a flip-flop that will go anywhere you want to go and it'll work. So this is our number one. It's got 7.62 by 39 bullet casings on it, combat boot rubber outsoles, and it's a fun, cool product and it looks good and people feel good when they're wearing it. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the other one is our Flopperator. So this is our all-terrain. Um, so everybody's big into the special operations movies now and all the operators. So we made one called a Flopperator so everybody can, can do good and look good at the same time. How do the people in Afghanistan or wherever these are made, how do they benefit? Uh, so jobs is the number one thing. You know, everybody would prefer to go to steady, employable jobs every day instead mm -hmm. of having to do dangerous work for a living. And I think what a lot of Americans fail to understand is that these terrorists and these bombings that we're seeing overseas, they're just somebody trying to feed their family. They get paid a couple hundred bucks to go plant a backpack bomb or to go shoot somebody when it's way more affordable, way more economical to provide them a job. And so they would much rather do that because they know if they do something dangerous, they're more likely to get killed and nobody wants to do that to support their family. Yeah. yeah. So when you were there in Afghanistan or Iraq, so was it, it wasn't about religion, it wasn't about politics, it was about poverty? Night after night, you catch these young boys, you know, anywhere from 16 to 24, 25 years old, and you drag them in and why are you doing this? Well, what else am I gonna do? There's no jobs here. How else am I gonna support my family? It's the same answer night after night after night, bagging hundreds of guys. Same story over and over again. So business not bullets makes a ton of sense. Makes a ton of sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, it made a ton of sense to the people at Shark Tank too. You gotta tell us about that. How'd that happen? Uh, long story, but you know, our story is kind of fun. Uh, the media picked up on it. And so Wes Seiler from Gizmodo, he wrote an amazing article about us, crushed our website for days. And then uh, about a month or two later, I got a call on a, late on a Tuesday night and it was a producer from Shark Tank. And he said, hey, I read about you guys in this article by Wes, uh, I'd like you to be on our show. And I don't watch TV. <laughs> so I, I told him no. I was like, nah, we're not gonna do that. You guys are like American Idol. You guys are just crushing young business owners just for ratings. And uh, the next day I told my team, and my, my chief marketing officer, Lee, goes, are you crazy? You call him back right now. So we, uh, we filled out the application um, and they brought us down to the show and we had a really great time with it. You know, we, we treated it like a special operations mission. We taped off the floor, we watched every episode, we tried to profile the sharks the best we could. And by the time that we walked into that room, we'd already been in there a thousand times. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, I mean, we'd, we'd done it over and over and we were you know, in the studio for about an hour and 45 minutes and I think they cut it down to about 10 but it was a fantastic, fun experience. And we got Mark Cuban, Damon John, and Lori Grenier to, to bite onto the mission. Hmm. And we are gonna get back to that, but I gotta go to the book first. Yeah. You have written a book. Uh, you said that uh, Rangers don't write books, but The Rise of the Unarmed Forces, that's a little different, huh? What's this book about? So we call all of our customers, if you buy our product, if you join our mission, you're part of our unarmed forces. We take them from the left, we take them from the right, straight, gray, gay, young, old, whatever, we don't care, but if you think that we should promote jobs and education over warfare, like you're on our team. Um, and this book goes through the mentality of how we started a company all the way through to our our backstage story on Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really entertaining, you'll get it. Uh, it's written by a ranger, so there's a lot of expletives in there. And it's been, it's been a great book, and um, my favorite review, I think I was telling you earlier, but uh, somebody wrote, this book grabs you squarely by the neck and doesn't let you go until you read every last page. And that's the best compliment we've got, because mm -hmm. it's a fun, entertaining airplane read. It's 160 pages, so it's, it reads really fast. It's up on the screen, and if you want to get it, go, go to combatflipflops.com, and that's a good place to, to get it right there. All right, so let's go back to Shark Tank then. So I've, I've watched the Shark Tank um, episode. It was, it was really cool. You guys, guys did a fantastic job. They actually paid a lot of attention to you. What do you think was the thing that turned it to the point where they wanted to invest with you? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that, that didn't make it in there, but they, they tried shooting holes in us every which way they could. And we've, we have answers. And that's what a lot of people don't have is they don't have answers. Like, how are you gonna, how are you gonna make it work? And, not only did we have the answer how to do it operationally, but we had the answer to do it financially. And they saw that in us and they said, okay, we're gonna support these guys, which has been a fun experience. Yeah, and so you guys made a deal. We made a deal, yeah. Now we're, we're working solidly with, uh, with Mark Cuban and his team now, and he's been a great supporter of the mission. Wow, fantastic. I gotta go though to the movie now. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm flying through this stuff because I really wanna get to the movie. 
Okay. You know, whenever you hear about a movie from, that talks about World War II or this war or that war, you think, you know, killing and violence. And that's not what that movie was about, was it? No, not at all. What's the name of the movie? It's called Here Am I, Send Me. And the, okay. the premise is like, you're going to hear a calling. There's going to be something that's challenging in your life. And there's going to be something that just moves you. It's got its own momentum. And you go like, this is meant for me. And uh, it's just, it was a just crazy story, but it's about the free falling uh, gold star mom into the opening ceremony of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, through you know what? We're going to go to the trailer right now. The husband and father was killed by a roadside bomb in Afghanistan on Saturday. He was just 29 years old. I'm Scotty Domey. I'm the mother of Sergeant First Class Christopher Domey. He was killed in action in October 22nd, 2011. It's why I'm here. You just want to do something to pay your respects to an individual who has, he, he legitimately changed the face of the Army. He was, he was larger than life. So this has always been something I want to do, to, to come out to Normandy and participate, and uh, no better way to do that than to conduct a static line airborne jump in the 75th anniversary. I'd love to jump to honor my son. Hey Griff, did you know my son? And he said yes. And I said, would it be possible to jump with Rangers? Like it's Chris's mom, right? If she wants to jump into Normandy, like she jumps into Normandy. Finally getting on that plane was just, you're just flooded with everything all at once. Seeing the other C-47s out the window. Just epic, ton of emotion. Having this jump to look forward to, kind of gave me some life. To be in the aircraft, stand in the door, and look out over the French countryside, it's like, we are gonna do this. We have willingly chose to put ourselves here. And now here, this group of 20 Americans, special operations veterans, and our family members, we're about to jump out of a plane over Caritan, France. Isaiah 6, 8, whom shall go and whom shall I send? And, and throughout my career, that send me has been a key part of, for me personally and for my team members. And, and we volunteered to do this. It just all kept falling together. It was meant to be. We're here today in a day of destiny because we were meant to be here. So I hope that the trailer makes you want to watch it even more, but let's hear a little bit more from Griff about it as well. Um, the story itself, there's so many different aspects to it, but, but you really talk about Chris's mom. Let's, tell us a little bit about Chris. So Chris was an Army Ranger. Uh, he was a fire supporter like myself. And early on in the war, we used close air support for to fight the war, but you had to have Air Force guys controlling Air Force planes to drop bombs, and we just didn't have enough Air Force guys. And so eventually, we allowed Army guys to get certified to do this job. Well, he was the first guy in the United States Army to be certified to drop planes off Air Force bombs. And when he did, it changed how the US military fights the war in Afghanistan, like how you employ close air support in order to achieve the objective. And because he was certified to be able to do it, and he was so effective at his job, um, he changed how not only the Ranger Regiment fought, but how the rest of the U.S. Army fought in Afghanistan and in Iraq and in other places of the world. So he saved lives. He saved a ton of lives. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but then there was a time where you uh, got the news that uh, he had been killed. Uh, he was killed by a roadside bomb. Like, dude's a legend. He was on a quick reaction force going to somebody else and... He wasn't supposed to be there on that deployment. Another guy had broken his leg and he stepped up to go in his place and was doing his job to go save some other people and he got hit by an IED. Hmm. It's tragic and he's a legend. Like you never would have thought that would happen. He's just like, holy crap, you know, just what a waste. But the bond that you had with him, you felt needed to live on. Um, you know, we'd served together, you know, you know, a couple different deployments and we'd known each other loosely and we always looked up to him. We were in different companies, so my interactions with him were, were finite but everybody looked up to Chris. And um, 
I, I think that more people should have known his name and what he did. And I think so far we're clicking over 100,000 views on YouTube. So now I know there's 100,000 more people that know Chris and what he did. Oh. And that's what's important to us. You know, it's interesting when I was uh, telling my 16-year-old daughter about uh, this film, uh, I was trying to relate World War II to Afghanistan, and she wasn't getting it mm -hmm. until she watched it. And um, can you kind of take us through, and how did the, how did the 75th anniversary of Normandy of D-Day, uh, how did that relate to what you did? It was, it was a selfish mission to start. My grandfather, he was an A-20 Havoc tail gunner, flew 52 missions over France, uh, flew for the British as a tail gunner, and he got shot down in that area. And it's always one of those things, first time he went out of a parachute was over France, and I always thought, like, I'm an airborne ranger, I'd love to jump, you know, have a piece of that history with him, it'd be cool. So I just registered to jump, and I hit share on Facebook, and the ranger community is pretty tight on social media, so Scotty says, hey, I want to jump, and... And Scotty is. Scotty's Chris's mom. And uh, she's like in her 70s, right? 71 years old. Uh -huh. and, and she wants to go jump out of an airplane? She wants to go jump out of an airplane. Is that something that she regularly did? She does not jump at all. And so a lot of people don't understand that like, it was it's static line jumping, which means you jump out at 800 to 1,000 feet. So that way you can get to the ground fast so you don't get <laughs> shot in the air. And it's a, it's a really hard landing. And um, there's no way we're gonna be able to train her up and safely get her to the ground to do that. So we actually had to go, I had to learn to skydive to do this. So You didn't know how to either? I didn't know how to skydive either. So I went and got my free fall license. I got another army ranger that served with Chris uh, as the Tana master. We got the world wingsuit champion from Red Bull to fly cinematography. We got uh, another army ranger, special forces Green Beret, who's now the Rocks stunt double. Oh. Uh, to fly camera for us and we hit up Google and YouTube and Cisco stepped in as a sponsor and they said this story needs to be told. And so we put it all together in about five months and it turned out spectacular. It, it truly is spectacular and uh, not only the trailer, we're also going to put up the, the link to it from YouTube so you can see it for free. How come you just didn't tell Chris's mom that, you know, hey, this is something that we, it's too dangerous for you to do. We might learn it, but you know, you're 71, you can't do this. You can do anything you want to. The, the motto of the Rangers is sua sponte, uh, which means to take authoritative action without prompting. It means of your own accord, you do it. And if you want to do something in this world, you can plan your way around it and do it. You can mitigate all the risks and make it happen. And people jump out of airplanes all the time into their 90s. And I think you see the 100-year-old like guys jumping out and like, you know, we can, we can get her to the ground safely. Well, and actually one of your co-jumpers there was uh, a World War II vet himself. Yeah, it was Tom Rice, 97 years old. And he went out right behind me. The last time he jumped out of a plane was into that drop zone on D-Day. It was a pretty cool experience oh, okay. to share that with him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hey, you know, knowing that he was uh, just a kid at the time. Just a kid. Yeah. Um, there are so many parts to this that I'd love to be able to talk about, but something that I absolutely have to is Flanders Field. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So it's a, it's a very famous poem, uh, it's for warriors, but it, it's symbolic of that area. Um, and you see it in the, in the UK and the Britain, the red poppy. And for all the soldiers that had crossed that terrain across Fan France had passed away in that area, uh, there's red poppies that come out of everywhere. They're just all over the ground and they symbolically represent the blood of the fallen soldiers that have, that have come through that area. And it's, it's a f famous poem in the warrior culture, and we were just driving in to go to Point to Ho that morning, and we looked to our left, and there's this just beautiful poppy field. And the, the production crew didn't know anything about it. They, you know, the, the warriors in the car, we, we knew the, the poem, and so I pulled over to the side of the road, and I said, hey, guys, like, you need to read this poem real quick, and we should probably just go shoot this. And we stepped into that field, and you just feel the loss that came out of there. And it was, really, it was a really cool 30 minutes that we just had serendipitously on the side of the road. And, I think a lot of people now are going to know what that means and they're going to feel it as well when they see it. The film showed the beauty of that area of France. Did it feel beautiful when you were there? Uh, it's amazing. It's gorgeous. The thing that hit me was, you know, we have everything at our access these days. We've got GPS on our phones. We can navigate around all these roads. You know, there's, there's, you're just not going to get lost anymore. And you think about these, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old kids who jumped out of a plane in the middle of the night and all they have is a map and a compass. And in that terrain, it's, it's really rolling and it's covered in hedgerows. And the, the, the part that just kept hitting to me is how scary it must have been for them because it, behind any one of those hedgerows, every 200 yards, there could be a German machine gun nest. And they had to 
land on the ground, find their friends, and then fight their way across France in that kind of terrain. And it was, you know, I was, I was feeling anxious just being there in, in that mindset. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's unbelievable what they did to that, during that day. There were some other parts though. During, I mean, during the day they showed the, I guess it's a cemetery, mm -hmm. um, but it just is cross after cross after cross. And what a lot of people don't understand about that American cemetery, which everybody should go and see, it's right above the beaches, but that was the second place they were buried. There were a lot of temporary cemeteries all over Normandy where U.S. service members and um, international military service members were buried. And then after the war, they had to exhume all the bodies and then move them all there. And when you think about the task of doing that, how you know they didn't have time to send their friends home. They had to put holes in the ground and put all their friends there mark their graves and keep track of them, and then they had to continue fighting. They had to leave all their buddies behind in that dirt. It just, no, I mean, it's, it's something it's, you don't do. You, it just, you just, it's, not, it's, not, it's foreign to us now. If you can imagine what the mindset that they had to do is put their friends in the ground and then continue fighting, what that must have done for them and their mindset. When you look back then at D-Day and, and the experience that you had, uh, and then you look forward to Afghanistan and the experience that you had yourself, I mean, is there a similarity? Um, I think there's just been a shift in American culture. We, we can't get it all together as a country. We can't get it done. There's just too many sides, too many opinions. And, and this was something that everybody believed was right. You know, a population of people were being oppressed and we needed to come together as a nation to help them. And it's, it's just weird to me that now, like, we can't figure it out. Like, we, there's p populations in which we're fighting that are being oppressed by narco-terrorists. Right? And we're sending very small numbers of soldiers to take, tackle this huge problem when it really requires a significant amount of weight and participation by all of America. So this goes back to business, not bullets. It does. Um, right on your website, you say, working at combat flip-flops isn't a typical job. There's no corner office, no water cooler, no break room. It's more of a calling, a duty, a way of life. We're creating a new path forward, a way to create jobs, fund women's education, and create change in some of the toughest places on the planet. Change that will last even longer than our shoes, which last a really long time. So, even though you're you don't have you're not in uniform anymore, mm -hmm. are you still fighting the battle? Um, it's like West Point. You have your mottos, and our motto, class of two thousand one, is "Till duty is done." Right? We signed up to help these people. We're not going to quit until it's done. Yeah. When you were in Afghanistan, did you meet some of the kids that you're helping today? Uh, yeah, none of the kids that we're helping today. Um, we fought a very much a different war than we're fighting now. And when we were first there, special operations had essentially won the war in the first couple months, and you had to go and find these pockets of, of fighters. So we lived in villages. We took the trucks and we drove them as far into the mountains as they would go, and we got in the helicopters and flew them as far as they would go, and then we would live in villages and go valley to valley, and we would slaughter sheep at night for dinner. Um, they would feed us all the food out of their out of their stores for the winter because they wanted those people gone. They saw America was there to provide them freedom, opportunity, education, and they they wanted that. So you made yeah. friends of Afghanis. Yeah, and like we stayed in small schoolhouses. Like they we partnered with them. Mm -hmm. It's very much different. And then fast forward, you know, twenty years, and look at where we're at now. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's for sure. But then I want to go back though. To D-Day, because one of the other parts of the film, though, was where there was an old French man came out who had basically built a wall himself of commemoration to so many of the people who he met. Uh, that's just an amazing story, so I'll, I'll see if I can give the short version of it here. But his name's Lucien. Um, he was 10 years old, so he had an older brother that was in the house that was dying. And an American uh, soldier, Frank McKay, he was a medic. Um, when Lucien popped out of his house in the morning, he was you know, right outside his gate. And Lucian brought him in and says, hey, my brother's sick. And so Lucian's like, I don't have the medicines to help him here, but I'll be back. Three days later, you know, Frank goes, finds his unit, fights his way, and comes back and then saves his brother. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing story. And then Frank disappears to go on a fighting in the war. And so Lucian, up until the, was the 80s or 90s, had been trying to find this guy. And Eisenhower's daughter hears this story, leverages her connections, and finds the guy's name's Frank Mackey. And he had uh, gotten shot uh, six, seven weeks later, and he couldn't get enough blood, and so he passed away. 
solution. Um, just built a wall and this place is in the middle of nowhere. Unless you know where to go in France, you're not gonna get to Lucien's house. And he's 85 years old, um, he's dying. This is the last time he's probably gonna be able to tell the story. But he built this commemorative wall that's gonna last hopefully thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And people are gonna see the names of American soldiers who went there and freed that region, which is symbolic. It's pretty cool. Wow. Sounds like then the way that you were received in you know, 2018, 2019, was with open arms and love for Americans. When you go to Normandy, France, you are gonna see exponentially more American flags than you see in any American neighborhood. And they're there 24 seven, 365. Those people, they really understand what our country did for them. Um, and they told the stories of the Nazi oppression. They didn't like being oppressed. They didn't like being pushed down. And the fact that thousands of Americans had fought their way across that terrain and given their lives to give them back their freedom. They, they don't forget that. So then combat flip-flops, that's your mission now? It is our mission now, yeah. It is a calling. There are so many times we could have failed. I mean, we have, you know, people see our company as a, as a success and when you read the book, you're gonna hear about a significant number of failures that we had that almost like drove us into bankruptcy and everything else that would, can go wrong in a small business. but. For some reason, good things just keep happening. Well, no, that's my question. <laughs> how, how come, why do good, keep, good things keep happening? I mean, why is it that you have succeeded where so many others have failed? Because, you know, you weren't trained as a business person, were you? Not at all. We have no for manufacturing experience, no business experience, no e-commerce experience. Mm -hmm. And we created an online business to, to help people. Where, where are your goods made? Uh, so our footwear is made in Bogota, Colombia. So the war on drugs, right? So we have mm -hmm. that. And uh, our textiles are made in Afghanistan. So we have the war on terror. Uh, we have our jewelry made in Laos, uh, which is left over from the Vietnam War. And then we make t-shirts and hats and stuff here in America. So what's next for you? Uh, what's next for us is, you know, we've, we're just really just trying to get on the gas. We've really shrunken down our product line. We did the, being a small business owner is, is tough. You know, you, we, we've grown significantly. And when you grow significantly, you need to think you need to expand your product line and that wasn't the best for us. And so over the last year, we've really shrunken everything down to the products that people want, they wanna buy, that really drive the mission forward. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really buckling down and focusing on that right now. You've already told us about how many uh, miles of land that you've reclaimed through your bracelet. How about? So for every product that we sell, we put a girl in school in Afghanistan for a day. Uh, can exp I'll explain it to you here in a bit, but we put over 750 girls in school for a year. Wow. Yeah, and I think that as Americans, if we said, hey, we went to Afghanistan and we made sure that every little girl in Afghanistan was literate, we could all puff our chest out and be proud of that. That's something as a country I think everybody would be happy with. No. We don't have any more time left. Gosh, this is just an honor to get to sit here with you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate it. Rainmaker believes we can